Hey there, Washington Heights. We are thrilled that you are joining us this Sunday morning. We hope that you are as excited to be together with the people of God as we are here today to be leading you in worship. Um, we hope that you might stand and join with us. You know the drill at this point. If you would just sing with us this morning, gather together as a church, for we are still called, even in this moment as a church, to arise and shine the glory of God that we know so to be true in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's sing together in unification as a church this morning.
has happened among you and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. For not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you that you are doing and will do the things that we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and the steadfastness of Christ. Let's close our time together in song by focusing on this beautiful truth that the Lord our God is steadfast in all circumstances. He will hold us fast.
heads and pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for that incredible truth that you hold us, you care for us in all things. Father, in just the simplicity of those words that we just sing, help us to find comfort. Help us not just to feel that we are going through the motions that we don't let that truth sink in and allow it to change and affect our lives. As we walk about such uncertainty, Father, we understand that we have no reason to fear for we are not called to be a fearful people. We are called to be a bold people. Father, all the songs that we sang about today, as a church, we need to take comfort in the fact that you care for us, you hold us, you are worthy to be praised. And because of that, we must go, we must share, we must be the church of God. Allow us to be the church of God in just a small way this next week. To be a spirit of peace and calm when it seems like everyone around us, all of our friends and family are Cling to chaos. Let us cling to the peace that you have provided for us, Father. Let us speak words of peace. Father, bring peace to our nation and our world right now. And more than that, bring them to their knees so that they might see you, Father. As only you can allow them to. We ask all this in your name. Uh, Pastor Justin here again here in Kettering, Ohio, and I'm meeting with my friends here, Mark and Jen, and they are not in Kettering. Can you guys share a couple things about what's going on? Hi, Washington Heights family. We wish we could be with you, but we're in Nicaragua where it's super hot and we're sweltering in this room because Justin made us turn the fan off so you could hear us well. Sorry. But we're glad to be here uh, with our whole family. Andy and Gabe are back from college um, finishing, they finished up online as well as our other kids being online. So we're glad to be all together. And Nicaragua is dealing with the virus. Um, we are, lack a lot of information here. The government is not very forthcoming about there really being a problem. So most people are deciding to take um, their own measures. Nothing's being um, uh, given out by the government, but uh, people are deciding themselves to take measures like wearing masks and washing their hands, all of those kind of things. Um, but that has caused us to not be able to have groups at the center, the ABW Ministry Center. So, um, of course, that's causing us to, to not have income as well. So please pray for God's provision for the Ministry Center during this time. Um, you also may have uh, seen that we um, have, are developing a project with Word of Life, and we it's called Soap and Hope, where the idea is to um, share and educate people on how to prevent the virus, how to uh, avoid the, pr the problems, washing your hands, all, all the things that we've all talked about for months now, um, to educate them and then also get an opportunity to share the gospel. So the goal is to go to 20 churches um, and meet with 30 people at each church that aren't members of that church, members of the community that the pastor brings in that aren't, um, aren't saved, and then we share the gospel with them and then also give them a packet of food and cleaning supplies um, and so that they can um, follow the instructions they're giving and help provide for their families during this difficult time. Awesome. Um, so we're excited about that. We just got started with a couple churches and the first of which was at uh, Raitos. We had the privilege of speaking with or talking with six different people and um, it's interesting because I specifically remember two of the six saying when we asked them, you know, if you were to die tonight, where would you go? Would you go to heaven or not? And um, they were like, well, we've made the decision, but we're not walking with the Lord. So I thought that was interesting that they, they at least knew that part. But um, there was also one more, his name is Eugenio. And he said, I, I don't want to make that decision yet because I'm fearful. I'm fearful of, because I have to give a testimony and I have friends and I'm just not ready to change my life yet. So we are definitely praying for him and those people. Um, the other thing too is we're, we're feeding at Raytos for the first time in probably five weeks. Wow. And so the kids are lined up around the building. There are 162 of them today. 
Um, but we don't like, they aren't praying and like having their normal thing. They just come through the line. So yeah, we're thankful that we're able to be here and, and serve in this way right now. Hey guys, thanks so much for sharing those prayer requests. We're praying for you. We miss you. Uh, thanks for spending the time. Thank you. And we just appreciate you, um, our Washington Heights family. We appreciate your partnership. Um, we love you and we miss you. And we're disappointed that the, the youth group can't come down this year. Um, maybe next year, hopefully next year. Um, but we love you guys. And thanks again for listening to us this morning. Thanks so much. Hello and welcome to Washington Heights Church. We are so glad you have chosen to join us today. And we especially want to say to all of you mothers out there, Happy Mother's Day. We're glad you're with us. We want to have a chance to encourage you out in any way that we can, and so we ask you to please contact us here at Washington Heights Church. If you simply text the word CONNECT to the number you see in the screen right now below me, uh, that will give you a chance to um, be in contact with us and us a chance to reach out to you as well. Uh, we're not doing this to try and sell you things or, or push a lot of information your way. We simply want to open a chance for you to let us know how God is working in your life or if there's some way we can help you and hopefully let you know how much we appreciate you sharing your time with us today. We have recently been going through a number of studies that have been responding to some of the tensions and pressures we feel as we have been secluding ourselves in the stay-at-home orders related to the virus. Well, we're hoping very soon that we will be back gathering together as the people of God. And in fact, in the next week or two, we might be able to make an announcement about when that will happen. But I thought it might be good to turn our attention to just some studies that are uplifting in our relationship with God. And so today I'd like us to look at a passage of scripture that really is about how we love God. Would you take your copy of God's word and open with me to Exodus chapter 20. Now, for those people who know their Bibles well, and I know many of you do, you're going to right away say, Dave, that's, that's the Ten Commandments. And yes, it is. And when we hear that, I think sometimes we just get this little, you know, sense of like electricity shooting up and down the back of our necks when we go, oh, the Ten Commandments, that's serious stuff. That's, that's harsh and demanding. Um, I want to encourage you that we might be able to look at the commandments in a new way. Because I believe that the Ten Commandments are a great statement of God's love for us and our love for him. You might recall that when the Pharisees challenged Jesus about the law, they said to him, what is the greatest commandment? And he responded, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. When that was asked, in fact, in Luke's gospel, the, the Pharisees immediately responded, who is my neighbor? And Jesus gave them the story of the Good Samaritan. And we begin to realize our neighbor is actually everyone, and maybe especially those in need. As Jesus said that, he also then said, on these two commandments... To love the Lord our God and to love our neighbor hangs all the rest of the law and the prophets. And so we begin to see that all of the law and the prophets God intended as a statement of his love. And when we come back to the Ten Commandments, we really see that strongly. Will you follow along as I read? It says, And God spoke all of these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children of the third and fourth generation of those who hate me 
but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. As we read those two commandments, to understand that we should have no other gods before Jehovah and that we are to make no images in worshiping him, I often think that we lose the real focus of what God is saying to us. You see, what God is really saying in these passages is that he loves us and he wants us to love him. If I can point it out for just a minute, that first statement, have no other gods before me or beside me, is actually a statement that is prefaced by another statement that says, I am the Lord your God. He makes it very personal. I brought you out of Egypt. He says, I saved you. And I don't want you to have any other gods before me. When I hear that, I have to tell you, I'm reminded of the time when, when I stood in a church before a preacher and I stood beside Wendy and we made vows to each other of marriage. I looked at her and I couldn't believe that she was willing to marry me. And I made promises to her. Promises that I would love her and cherish her and be faithful to her and that I would abandon all others and she would be my wife. And she said the same to me. And you see, at that point, what, what was happening is we were expressing this love for one another. And that's exactly what's behind God's presentation of his commandments here. He says, I am the Lord, and he uses that covenant name Jehovah. He goes, I am the Lord, your God, your personal God. And he says, I chose you. You didn't choose me, in fact. He says, I chose you, and I redeemed you out of Egypt. I showed my love, and I showed my power, and I showed my grace to you when I redeemed you out of Egypt. In fact, what puts that into even greater context is something we read over in the book of Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, God says this, It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the least, he says, of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath he swore to your fathers that he has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery. The truth of the matter is that the people of Israel didn't really have anything to offer to God, and yet he loved them. They weren't the largest, and they weren't the most powerful, and they weren't the richest or the most influential, and yet God said, I've chosen you. I love you. And it's a great statement of his grace and his character. And so he says, have no other gods besides me. When I read that, I'm inclined to ask, how easy is it for us to be seduced away to another god? You know, one of the things that we come to understand in marriage is that the, the idea of maintaining the commitment of faithfulness is one that we are reaffirming every day because there are opportunities and in our society there are temptations that want to break up families and break up marriages and pull a couple apart. And we have to come back and we have to sometimes just be reminded that this is our husband, this is our wife, and we have no others beside them. When God gave his statement, his commandment to his people, he said, have no other gods. He was saying, I am the only God, and let's not miss that. In fact, he had already demonstrated his power in conquering the gods of Egypt and proving they were no gods at all. And we see that again and again throughout Scripture. But that's not the real point 
of the passage. He's already asserted himself in so many ways as the I am and the one God. But what he's really saying here is that, that the people of Israel, the people of Israel should see that he is their only God. And he loved them. And he redeemed them. And they should be faithful to him. No other gods. And yet, other gods creep in, don't they? We become tempted with technology, um, saying, I can do this, or I'm able to provide, and I don't need God anymore. We become tempted with our desires, saying, I want to live for the things that please me and not for the things that please God. We become tempted with sex and saying, I don't want to be faithful in my human existence because I want to live for myself, and I'm certainly not going to be faithful in my spiritual existence with God. We become tempted with money and power and selfishness, and all of these things become other gods that seduce us away. I want to encourage us today to see God as our only God, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of scriptures that is revealed to us, the God who became man in Jesus Christ and gave himself for us. And to see this God as a God who loves us and who graciously calls us into a relationship with him. That's the God of the first commandment. In the second commandment, we see how we live with this God and respond to him. It says there that we should not make any images. It says not carved images and, and not images that look like anything, whether they're in heaven or they're on earth or they're below the earth. We should not try to put God into some kind of a form that we as human beings can control. That's really the point. The truth of the matter is that the first commandment kind of covers everything. There's no other God. There is no other God that exists and there should be no other fake God that comes up in our life and replaces him. God is God. And so if the first commandment is so solid, why do we need the second? Well, it's because he's not just talking about us having other gods that we carve out of silver or stone or wood or, 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 or whatever material we make it up out of, he, he's saying don't have, don't have a God that you think is me but really isn't. A famous Puritan preacher, Thomas Watson, actually described it this way. He said, in the first commandment, Worshiping a false god is forbidden. But in the second commandment, worshiping the true God in a false manner is forbidden. You know, that would become a very real problem for the people of Israel in just a short period of time. As they were gathered there on Mount Sinai and as God was giving these words to Moses, down in the the valley around the mountain, the people were becoming, they were becoming um, upset and, and impatient and, and getting discouraged about how long it was taking. And before long, they cried out and they said, we, we need a God to lead us. And of course, they created the golden calf. And God judged them severely because, you see, they were saying, this is Jehovah. Aaron even would say to the people, this is your God. But, but he wasn't. He was their very weak and very incomplete representation. And even though it wasn't some foreign God or it wasn't some uh, God that didn't really exist, they said, oh, this is Jehovah. They were representing him in entirely the wrong way. And they were not, they were not loving him. They were not loving Jehovah. They were loving some image that they had created, something that was, was within their control. And that's the danger we have. And that's what the second commandment warns us against. It warns us against trying to make God in our image or in images that, that we could relate to or worse, that we could control. I want to ask you a, a simple question. Are there things in your life where 
where you have come to try and create God in your image? I know that I've, I've done that in mine. I've had experiences where I've said, this is my God. My God acts this way. My God worships this way. I can count on my God to do this for me. And sometimes I've let that take me down a path that wasn't real. You say, what are you, spe- what are you speaking about specifically, David? Well, let's take the question of love and justice. See, it's easy for me to say, my God is a God of love, and so then I want to to show love to people. But sometimes, when we're showing love, we have to also say, but this is truth. Sometimes when we're showing love, we have to say, God loves you, and I love you, but what you're doing is wrong. And when we do that, we get uncomfortable. And so it's easy for us to say, well, I'm going to have a God that's love only and I'm not going to talk about his justice. I'm not going to talk about his righteousness. I'm not going to talk about his judgment. Well, if we do that, we've created a God who is not the real God because we're called upon to love him as he is. That's what we see in the second part of the second commandment. This part makes us uncomfortable. But it says, You shall not bow down or serve these gods, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. When we read that, we are inclined to think of jealousy as we think about it in our selfishness. Uh, I'm, I'm worried. I'm afraid of losing what I have. I'm selfish to hang on to what I like or what I love even, and I'm going to be jealous about it. I'm going to hold it and restrict it and I'm going to really be angry when it doesn't fall out the way that I think it should. And then we read where it says here that this jealous God visits iniquity to the children of the third and fourth generation and we are right away inclined to go, that's not my God. But you see, if we make an image of God that isn't who he truly is, we're not really loving God. We're loving ourselves and our ideas of God. But then you say, David, that sounds really harsh. And I agree, at first glance it might, but I want to challenge you with something very different going on here. You see, he says, I am a jealous God. And and in this case, it doesn't mean that he's selfish like we are. Think of it more like a district attorney who is jealous for justice and jealous for the law, meaning he won't let a criminal get away with breaking the law without facing his responsibility for that. He he will preserve society and preserve the peace and the order that the law has created and therefore he will be jealous to prosecute the law so that the order and the truth is maintained. But then you say to me, but the third and fourth generation, that's not fair. It wasn't their fault. We have to look at this in light of the whole passage. You see, what God says is that the iniquity will be on the third and fourth generation. How many of us as parents haven't struggled with the fact that we know that some of the things in our life that aren't good show up in our children? Uh, Sometimes, you know, we've had that classic experience of, of, well, my mom said that, but I'm never going to say that to my kids until right up at that moment when we do. And it's like, oh my, I just heard my own father, my own mother coming out of my voice and I'm passing that on to my kids. And what God is saying is that for those who hate him, that iniquity will pass on to the third and fourth generation and in his justice, he will judge it. But don't think that it stops there. Because you see, this is not a passage that is describing God in, in a, as a wrathful, harsh unfeeling being because he says that well it is true that it will pass on that iniquity it is also true that his steadfast love is shown to thousands of those who keep his commandments he says yes my justice and my righteousness are true but he also says my grace and my mercy and my love are even more powerful and for those who love me I will provide protection I will provide encouragement and my love and my steadfast grace will extend 
to a thousand generations. And, and what we see, in fact, is that our loving and righteous and trustworthy God is a loving and merciful God. And all he asks is that we love him as he is. On this Mother's Day, I'm encouraged that we sometimes do forget how much we love our moms. Someone was asking about a mother's love. And this is one thing that I came across that I thought captured it beautifully. It said, a mother gave you birth and spent countless sleepless nights taking care of you. Wiped your rear side thousands of times. Worried herself sick whenever you were ill or when something bad might happen to you. Celebrated you when you first smiled, when you first rolled over on your belly, when you first sat up, or when you took your first step. A mother has lived for years without a decent vacation or a decent night's sleep. Now, when we read that, we, of course, realize that there are parents who are, for various reasons, broken and may not live entirely up to that standard. And we certainly, we certainly grieve for those situations and seek to support any children who might be caught in an environment like that. And yet, the truth is, that is not the majority. In fact, the vast majority of parents... They love their children and they invest in their children and they are dedicated to their children and they sacrifice and give up and help and support their children. They would, as the saying goes, take a bullet for their children in a moment. And that's a mom's love. And today we celebrate mom and I hope you've done all the right things that will allow you to make mom feel great about this special day. But I say that because that's what the commandments are there to show us. And these first two commandments show us that relationship with God. They show that he chose us and he loves us. And he asks us to love him back, to put him first. And they also remind us that we need to love him as he is, not as we want him to be. When I think about that, I'm reminded of, an, of a movie I saw some time ago. It was a romantic comedy, and the truth is, it was one of those really kind of absurd settings where the situations are just not hardly possible. But the, the couple involved, of course, are thrown into all kinds of ridiculous circumstances where their relationship is tested and their personality is shown. And, and in the end, even though they started out hating each other, they finally fall in love and realize they were right for each other. We've seen the plots a thousand times. But in this particular movie, at a critical point, when they were beginning to understand who they were and what was important in their lives, the young man turns to the young lady and he simply says, if your house were on fire and you had 60 seconds to get out, what's the first thing you would grab? Well, of course, that was a way of saying what is most important to you. Well, in this particular romantic comedy, the young lady was torn between two gentlemen and, of course, one, not the not the lead of the story, one had proposed to her and she felt, she felt that she should accept his proposal. And they were actually in the apartment that they were about to, to uh, take over as their home and they were having a party to celebrate their engagement and, uh, and she was looking at a fire alarm on the wall. And suddenly she goes over and she pulled that fire alarm and everyone was surprised and then began to move out of the apartment quickly. And what she did is she watched this man who supposedly has expressed his love for her while well, he, well, he ran around and gathered up all the things that he cared about and never once showed an interest in her or her well-being or her protection or her escape. In fact, as he was running out the door, he asked her if she couldn't grab one more thing for him. Well, of course, that showed her that she was not important in his life. 
I want to ask you today, if your spiritual house were on fire and you had 60 seconds to grab what was most important, would it be God? Would it be Jesus? Would you be looking for those things that protect your own salvation, your, your own desires and your own future and your own experience and expression of life? Or would you say, the most important thing to me is God? That's what these first two commandments establish, that God loved us, chose us, redeemed us, and is our God and our God alone. And that we love him as he is, not as we think he should be or as society thinks he should be or as we might want him to be, not in the style that we prefer, but we love him as he is. In his mercy, in his justice, in his love, in his salvation. Today I want to encourage you that God is here and has reached out to you. And if you will simply trust him, trust that he has come in the person of Jesus Christ, that Jesus offered himself, demonstrated how he loved you in his death for our sins on the cross, his power in the resurrection, and he comes to be your savior. Will you trust him today? And if you do, will you simply send me a note or a text would you send it to whbc.org, Washington Heights Baptist Church.org, and just say, Pastor Kissner, I have come to trust Jesus Christ as my Savior. I've put God first in my life. I would love to contact you and let you know how we can encourage you on the way. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time to celebrate mothers and the love that they have for us, and we love them that back. But Lord, we thank you most for your love for us, the expression of your love in our salvation, the choice that you have made to love us when we didn't really deserve it. And Lord, we pray that we will love you as you are, fully and completely. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.